Okay, so um, welcome. My name is Wolf Muna. I am the Chapel Grand Chair in Jewish Studies and the Director of the Center for Advanced Genocide Research of the War Foundation at USC. Uh, and I'm welcoming you all to this exciting uh, event. Uh, we have uh, one of the most uh, young scholars uh, on the topic of the Armenian Genocide here today. Um, this event was made possible on one hand by the Center for Advanced Genocide Research with uh, co-sponsoring from the uh, UFC Armenian Studies Institute and support from the uh, student organization of the Shaw Foundation, B5. Um, Ur Inger uh, came to us from the Netherlands uh, where he grew up and uh, he um, um, studied at the University of Groningen, uh, sociology first, uh, got his BA there, and then uh, was uh, doing a master's in Holocaust and genocide studies at the University of Amsterdam, uh, a master thesis which was awarded a prize, a national prize for uh, one of the best master thesis at that, uh, that given year. <coughs> and then he um, did his PhD uh, research at the University of Amsterdam and uh, finished in 2009 with cum laude, and uh, again received uh, a big prize, dissertation prize uh, of the Faculty of Humanities uh, of the University of Amsterdam. After uh, the successful defense of his uh, dissertation, he uh, did two postdoctoral uh, um, kind of research positions. One was at the University of Sheffield uh, in the United Kingdom, and the other one was at the Center for War Studies of the University Dublin in Ireland. Um, after this, he landed at Utrecht uh, University, where he's teaching uh, now um, at, uh, as an associate professor at the Department of History. Uh, since 2011, and this is also important, he is a research fellow of the Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam. Uh, his research interests are uh, generally more um, state formation, nation formation, with a particular focus on mass violence, and why is, uh, he is, uh, we invited him to uh, talk to us is that he, he is one of the most uh, innovative researchers on the topic of the Armenian Genocide. For his research, he won several awards, although in the morning he claimed these are just uh, Dutch awards. I would say never, uh, nevertheless, they are really uh, important research prizes for his research, and he also um, published his um, dissertation as an award-winning book uh, called The Making of Modern Turkey, Nation State in Eastern Anatolia. Uh, and remarkable is also that as uh, a researcher uh, in the Netherlands and in Europe, it is not easy to publish uh, the first book with Oxford University Press, which he achieved. So this is, uh, it's a big accomplishment and speaks to the um, recognition his research deserves and uh, also receives uh, worldwide now. Uh, he published another very important book on uh, um, the seizure of Armenian property, and this is an often overlooked, uh, overlooked topic. Uh, the seizure or the expropriation of property is one of the fundamental motiv motivations of mass violence when we talk generally about genocide. This is true not only for the Armenian genocide, but also for the Holocaust and other genocides. And here, I think, especially for the Armenian genocide, this is very important. And I think um, the books uh, also show um, his, I think, accomplishment in combining, on the one hand, a macro view, that means more general, uh, asking and addressing more general questions, and then combining this with often meticulous micro-historical research. So um, this will probably also show today in his um, uh, presentation. He wrote uh, several very influential articles on the topic of the Armenian gen genocide and also challenging the uh, genocide studies as a field uh, in general, asking questions which uh, uh, about uh, the definition of genocide, the problems of genocide studies as a field. So it goes, his interests go, go beyond uh, just the um, uh, research interest in the Armenian genocide. So uh, 
I'm really happy to have him here. Uh, I hope you uh, can give him a hand as a welcome, and then without further ado, I ask you to give your presentation. So. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Wolf, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. And thank you also for uh, inviting me um, for organizing um, this um, well, long promised um, trip to, um, to USC for this talk. Special thanks to Kia Hayes for organizing all of this um, in practical terms. Uh, I find it always difficult to speak after Wolf's elaborate introductions. He really raises the bar for the speaker, of course. I certainly hope to, uh, to meet the expectations here. Um, my talk today will be about the Kurds and the Armenian Genocide. And my central question will be, how did Kurdish people in 1915 get involved in various ways in the perpetration of the Armenian Genocide, as well as in resistance and in rescue? Because as you know, this year uh, is the centenary of the genocide, is commemorated in particular April uh, 2015, 24th of April especially is commemorated as kind of the, uh, the centenary of the beginning of the genocide because on 24 April 1915 many Armenian intellectuals beginning in Istanbul were arrested, uh, deported and killed. The genocide is not only important for because it's 100 years ago, uh, because what's in a number of course one might argue, uh, but also for the impact that it made in various societies. I mean this is a genocide that does not only concern the Armenian people, or even the Republic of Armenia, but it's a, a, a genocide that has, a, that has made a profound impact on societies such as Turkey, uh, but also Syria and Lebanon. And as we're sitting here in California also, um, you only have to take a trip around the city to Glendale, for example, to see how it made an impact in the memory of, di of diaspora communities as well. So my central question is, how do, how do people get involved in genocide? And I think in comparative genocide, this is one of the most pressing and also most difficult questions. I mean, the popular ideas they hold, if you would walk into the streets here and ask people, why do people commit genocide? A lot, would, a lot of people would argue because they're evil, or because they must be deranged, or th there's some other kind of psychological um, uh, problem that people have. But if you really delve into why, and how people get involved in uh, killing their fellow uh, human beings on a massive scale, then you, uh, you see a range of motivations. The motives for killing are very often very different. Um, and also the outcomes can be, quite, can be quite different. Some people who, of whom you did not expect them to get involved as perpetrators uh, become perpetrators. Others uh, of whom you expect they will become perpetrators become rescuers. And that's kind of the story I want to tell today as well. I want to talk a little bit about, so here's my structure. I hope you can see this um, on the PowerPoint slides. Um, first, I'll, I'll walk with you through, through how the Armenian Genocide developed in three regions in Turkey. And we'll talk about how, how the Kurds behaved in these three different regions. And, and these are the areas of Diyarbakir, Dersim, and Shurnak. My nuts. Uh, immediately ring a bell, but I'll show some maps and I'll hope that this puts it into context. And what I'll argue is that the genocide developed in different patterns in these regions. And I think that in itself is also an interesting question. Why is it that one and the same genocide, and actually this is the case for most genocides, including the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide, why do they develop regionally differently in different areas of the same society in which uh, it is perpetrated? We'll look a little bit at memory and oral history after that. I'd um, like to show, if that's possible, I think it works, a short clip from a documentary in which a testimony is taken of one of the children of the perpetrators. And I'll also offer some explanations of so why did people get involved in particular ways. Now, first and foremost, I have to argue here, this is one important message I, um, I, try, I try to give when I speak about the, the Armenian Genocide, is that the Armenian Genocide is not one particular phenomenon. It is not just a massacre or just a deportation. No, it's a multi-dimensional and multi-directional process of at least 
seven or eight different um, policies. These policies, they overlap to some extent, but they're also sequential. So one happens after, after the other. And only together, if you take them together, only together they produce this intended and deliberate process of destruction. Now these policies are the following. Persecution, it can range from stigmatization, boycott, economic boycott, uh, forced emigration and internment. Uh, decapitation of the community, by that I mean the arrest and the liquidation of the intelligentsia, because intelligentsia is often seen as vanguard of a community. Uh, expropriation, uh, Wolf briefly mentioned it. In any genocide, it's extremely important uh, for the perpetrators to dispossess the victim group because wealth or capital is one way in which a community can defend itself or can uh, protect itself. Once they are stripped of their possessions, a community becomes much more vulnerable. And there are examples from the Holocaust, but also in the genocides in Bosnia and in Rwanda, we see uh, very, very large dispossession policies. Then we have, of course, one of the core problems in the Armenian Genocide, the mass deportations of the civilian population. Now, there's still some debate going on whether this was about land or about the people. So did the Turkish government want the Armenians to not exist in this particular territory? Or did the Turkish government not want the Armenians anywhere on the planet at all? So there's a bit of debate going about that. The fifth important dimension of the Armenian Genocide, as in all genocides, was mass murder, of course. In genocides, people have to be killed. And so too in the Armenian Genocide, paramilitary groups, that's why I mentioned it briefly, paramilitarism is very important. In most genocides, the victims are killed through these special militias that are tasked with the, um, uh, with the, well, the very important task of, of liquidating physically the victims. Then we have, two or three aspects of the Armenian Genocide that are quite peculiar. Uh, number six here is forced assimilation. A lot of Armenian women and children, small children, were taken and forcibly um, Islamized, forcibly made into Muslims and Turks. And so let's say that you were an Armenian boy, four years old. During the genocide, it could happen that you were kidnapped uh, f away from your family, your name would be changed, you would be uh, uh, circumcised, you would be given a new name, Turkish name, and you would be raised as a Muslim. So to, forget an, to forget your identity and to erase any sense of, uh, of Armenianness. These, these are what I call the, the disappeared, the desaparecidos. And it sounds better in, in Spanish. Also because um, obviously in Latin America in the 1970s, this was one of the major policies under the dictatorships then. So it raises issues of gender. Was this a gendered genocide? Did this genocide attack men differently from women? Uh, the answer is yes, I think. Uh, and of course, an absence of biological racism. So any kind of you know, Nazi conception of, of Jews clearly was different from the Turkish conception of Armenians because as an Armenian, you could change your identity and become Turkish or become Muslim. And of course, in the Holocaust, in, in the middle of the Second World War, this was simply not possible. Um, then we have number seven. So it's a long list. You see how complex this process is. We have a political crime, a forced famine. Uh, a lot of Armenians were placed in a region in Turkey where food access was not just restricted, but was prohibited, uh, which created, of course, mass death. Now, we tend to think that famines are crimes of omission. And so, yeah, the, you know, the harvest failed in Ethiopia, so, you know, two million people died. There's nothing we can do about it. That notion, in some cases, is wrong, because here we're dealing with a crime of commission. The government created this special zone in which Armenians were denied food, with the expressed intention of destroying uh, these, uh, these civilians. And finally, we have destruction and, let's say, the destruction of memory. Uh, there were approximately 3,000, 3,300 Armenian monasteries and churches in the Ottoman Empire. A lot of these were dynamited after the Armenians um, had been forced to, to leave or uh, were destroyed. Uh, 
And also any other kind of sign or any other um, symbol of Armenian identity was, was erased or defaced in various ways to reshape and destroy them, their memory. So I think it's important to, to bear this complexity in mind. We're not just dealing, a lot of my students, they ask me, uh, Dr. Inger, I'd like to do research on the Armenian massacre, or I'm interested in the Armenian deportation. Fine, but the Armenian genocide cannot be reduced to just massacre or just deportation, as if those two things weren't bad enough. Now, um, to, to get a sense of scale, I hope this is somewhat uh, visible. Uh, here's a map of the Armenian population density uh, in the eastern provinces of what is now Turkey. And what we see in this region, so the darker the blue, the higher the density in the various districts. Uh, in this region, Armenians lived in uneasy and sometimes hostile coexistence with Turks, with Arabs, and especially with Kurds. So in many of these regions uh, were split Armenian and Kurdish. So the, the, the Kurds were a major uh, kind of uh, player in Armenian history as well. And it's important, I think, to, to bear that in mind, to understand how this coexistence, how this inter-ethnic, um, how these inter-ethnic relations, how they changed. And, and I know that Richard Antaramian's work deals with the 19th century, which is a very important period in which the relationships between, Turks, between Kurds and Armenians changes. Now, if you would walk into a library and you would pick up a survivor memoir, and just this morning we watched a few of these testimonies from the USC Shoah Foundation's archive. If you would get some of these Armenian memoirs and you would look for references um, to the Kurds, then you would find quotes such as the following, such as this one. This is from an oral history by Donald Mil Miller and Lorna Miller. So this is a survivor from Kirje, small small town. And I quote, before I could catch my breath, a hefty Kurd appeared before, before me. He ordered me to take off my clothes and shoes and hand them over to him. I had no choice but to comply. I sat there dazed and shaken, but grateful that my life had been spared." End of quote. So there's a kind of um, very typical descriptions of very blanket category of the Kurds. Um, there's, of course, for the situation, this is also understandable, no real understanding of their profile, of their motives. So, you know, this is somebody who robbed you, but, but why? Why did he leave you alive? might also be an interesting question. And descriptions of the Kurds are very often too categorical in these, um, these kind of memoirs. Uh, on the other hand, we also have very good memoirs, such as the book on the right by, um, uh, this is Khachadur Pilidosyan. He wrote a very touching memoir, I think. They called me Mustafa, in which he was a young Armenian boy who was kidnapped and raised as a Kurd, and who <coughs> witnessed Kurdish society from the inside and saw the complexity of this, uh, of this uh, community as well. And there are other, uh, other books to this, uh, of this kind. Now there's one fundamental thing that needs to be pointed out here, which is that any depiction of the Kurds, or, or in any case, in any other ethnic group really, is too categorical. Because, and I'll show you this map, the Kurdish society is severely fractured. It's a very, um, I would say an un in, unintegrated uh, society or community. There are major tensions between urban and rural communities, between cities and countryside. There are religious differences between Sunni Muslims and, uh, and Alevi mu Muslims, so an offshoot of uh, Shiism. Uh, there are ethnic differences. Some Kurds speak one dialect, the others speak the other dialect. And then there's the problem of East-West, in that Kurds living in the Ottoman Empire had a really different state tradition than those living in Iran. But what the fundamental reality here is that Kurdish society is tribal. So here's a map of some major tribes in, um, in Turkey, and then you can see Syria and Iraq there as well. And I think it, to understand Kurdish society, including their participation in the Armenian genocide, we have to understand how these tribes functioned. So what is the logic of tribalism? Right? Now, tribes very often, of course, are a function of indigenous peoples. Um, 
I mean, of course, we have Native Americans and Aboriginals. There are various groups, ethnic groups within the, those communities also who function according to tribalism. And I think that complex logic we need to understand a bit better. So what I'll do now is I'll give you three examples of how the genocide unfolded and how the logic of tribalism influenced the genocide, sometimes decisively influenced the genocide. And I'll start first with the southeastern province and city of Diyarbakir, right here. So this is a state, oh, this was a state is an American term, it's a province uh, in the southeast of, um, of Turkey, which was approximately one-third Christian, two-third Muslim, and it's about the size of the state of Massachusetts, so you get a sense of how large it is, and had, during the genocide, a very thorough destruction of Armenian communities. Uh, approximately 97% of the community was, uh, was destroyed here, the, uh, those who um, witnessed the genocide. Now, what happened in this, in this region in 1915? In March 1915, the Turkish government appointed the gentleman on the left in this picture, Dr. Mehmet Rashid. Now, this was a, quite a radical nationalist who hated Armenians, hated the Russians, and hated any, any Christian community, basically. They appointed him here, there, to that province, so he could organize this militia, special, and I talked about paramilitaries, a special militia that would be tasked with the destruction of the Armenians. And within a matter of weeks, he rounded up the Armenian elites. So these are um, economic elites, religious elites, you know, the priests, the businessmen, the teachers, but also the politicians, of course, top politicians were all arrested as well and put them all in prison. Now that was March, early April 1915. Mid to late April 1915, especially late April, orders came through from Istanbul to dispatch of these, these Armenian elites that were arrested. And what Rashid did is he contacted one of the most notorious bandits in this region, a Kurdish uh, bandit. He was also a chieftain, so head of one of the tribes, and for a long time, he had an, an, an arrest warrant on his head. And that's the man, uh, the man on the right. You can see his picture. Um, uh, he was uh, recruited, and then he was asked to come to the, um, the building of the, of the governor, to the seat of the governor, and to receive some instructions. Right? But he, had an, uh, he, he actually had an officially, officially he had an arrest warrant on his head. Right? So how is it possible that this man, who can be called the Tony Soprano of his time, and if you want to put it in contemporary terms, and he was called in to, to talk with the head of the state in this province. Now that was rather ominous, of course. And the descriptions of how he entered the city and received these instructions are really fascinating. And I'd like to read together with you um, a description by, um, by the Armenian man, uh, Thomas Mugurdichian, who described how this man, his name was Omer, how he walked into the city. I will read this. Omer was of a short stature, darkish with smallpox scars on his face. He wore a big turban on his head around which hung many colored silk insignias to show that he was a Kurdish chieftain. He also wore a black short tunic, local made, long breeches and red shoes. Being armed with a Mauser rifle, two revolvers, a sword, a dagger, a yataran, this is a saber, big sword, and carrying with him an enormous amount of bullets and cartridges. Now this man walks into the, the seat of the governor and the, you know, the city just kind of stops in, in, in the fear that was palpable in the, on the streets. Because what is going to happen now this man um, will receive his instructions from the governor. And, what happens after that, very, very rapidly, within a week, um, Omer organized, together with the governor, the destruction of the Armenian elites in that city. And he kind of got away with it until he was eliminated himself by the state. And what happened in between, so the Armenian genocide in this city, uh, is pretty well documented. And uh, here's a, uh, an account of a, um, of a bank director, an Armenian bank director, who was put on one of these rafts, later to be more, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, 
And this is the last letter that this man sent to his family before he was arrested and placed in a convoy to be deported by this Kurdish chieftain. And he wrote, I quote, my dears, what is going to become of us is now unclear. I'll probably be sent towards Mosul, the city in Iraq, together with all my compatriots. Now it is left for you to be brave and to endure every difficulty. What can we do? Fate brought us to this. Only continue to pray for us. As for my journey, bring me one of the boy's sheets, a small rug, pillow, and two or three underclothes. My blue jacket and vest. In addition to this, my summer jacket, trousers, and whatever else is suitable to wear. I must not forget also a lot of cheese, chorek, it's a kind of pastry, and prepare a box of halba, which is sweets. Use your judgment and put all this together in the best way you can. Give, the, give these to Haji Gharabet so he can, bring them to, he can bring to me. He is our servant. Bring a cognac bottle filled with ohi, araki, this is a kind of liquor, with you so you can pass it secretly to me. Do not be too late. All of you come so, so that I can see you for the last time. Kisses to you, your father, Filibos Arpiarian. So this is a very kind of very touching last letter that this man sent to his family. But what happened is that on May 30th, 1915, Omar, the Kurdish chieftain, put all these men, approximately 600 of them, on rafts. So these are rafts on the Tigris River, uh, bound them by the hands, handcuffed them, and um, sailed them down the river to a uh, gorge where there was no, there were no eyewitnesses. Uh, the men, the victims, the Armenians, they were then stripped. They had to hand over all their possessions, and they were then massacred, mostly with axes and with swords, in some cases, sh sh mass shootings. He then uh, went back to the city, and a week later, the ritual was repeated with, an, with another 600 men. After the job was done, as I said, um, Omer was also killed himself by the state. So the government simply used this man, who was a notorious criminal, used him for the dirty job, and afterwards got rid of him. And I think this is a very interesting kind of way that the genocide developed here. So that's one, one example, how it worked out in one region. Now I'd like to move to a second region, slightly north of the Arbekir. And this is a, the region called Dersim, which is where part of my family and even Richard Antaryamian's family is from, roughly speaking. Um, and this was a Kurdish Alevi stronghold. So um, in, in Turkey, but there are basically two kinds of Kurds, Sunni Muslims and Alevi Muslims. And there are kind of differences in religion here. Uh, state authority was always weak here. To, so the, the, um, the tribes kind of ran their own show. They were semi-autonomous, really. And there was no real support for pro-government militias, those tasked with the killing of Armenians. Now, what happened in the genocide is very interesting here. And we have a beautiful eyewitness account by the American missionary Henry Riggs. Here, a picture on the left. And he wrote a book or his memoirs, Days of Tragedy in Armenia, which tells the story of the underground railway, the secret escape route through Dersim, where many Armenians could escape to Russian held, to the Russian held north. Now, one of the men who was in, involved in, in organizing these, um, these escapes was a man on the right, and he was a Kurdish chieftain, Sayyid Raza, of the Abbas tribe, a completely different tribe in the north. And he, together they rescued, because Henry Riggs knew of this, of course he helped organize part of it. Together they rescued, according to some accounts, hundreds, other accounts speak of thousands of rescued Armenians. We'll, uh, unless there's some proper research, we'll, we don't know yet, and I, don't, uh, I, I wouldn't like to, uh, to estimate here. Now, back then, we had rather simplistic explanations of this. The explanations were, well, it's because of the religious, different religious identity that these Kurds rescued the Armenians. But I think that's very simplistic. I think we have to look much more at how opportunity structures uh, informed the rescue. So here's a map of a Russian-occupied Ottoman Empire. So the red line shows the Russian line of um, uh, the, the, the front, the Russian front. And as you can see, the blue, marked in blue, region of Dersim is right at the Russian zone. So it's a kind of a buffer zone. And this created, in my opinion, opportunities for escape and also for these Kurds earning income by smuggling Armenian civilians across the lines 
into Russian-held and therefore free, quote unquote, um, territory. So this is a kind of human trafficking. And of course, we tend to think of human trafficking as a terrible thing. But in this case, it actually rescued some people from uh, near certain death. I've spoken once with, as you can see, there's a river running to the north uh, where the red line and the blue line crosses. That's the Euphrates River. And I did an interview with an old man a couple of years ago who had a boat and took Armenians across the river. And I asked him, um, well, you know, how did, you, how did this make you feel? We had to rescue, you, you, you are a hero, you rescued these people. And he said, no, I don't even like Armenians, he said. But I was paid well to take these people across the river. So here's an interesting thing. He didn't like Armenians necessarily, but on the other hand, he rescued several hundreds of them by taking them to safety. So that's a second interesting example in which tribes play a very important role in shaping the outcome of the genocide. The third region I want to look at is this region, and I hope this is clear. Uh, this is the border region between Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. You get, you get a sense of where this is. And this region is called Tur Abdin, roughly, and there's a small town called Shudnak, right in the middle. And this, is, this was a stronghold of Assyrian cultural life. So Assyrians are obviously different from Armenians. They adhere to the Syrian Orthodox Church. And uh, there are many monasteries here, a large population of Assyrians. But also one of the most powerful Kurdish tribes lives in this uh, region. And I say lives because the tribe more or less roughly still exists and still continues to influence politics in this border region. So anybody who follows the Syrian civil war, if you look at how the civil war is developing in this region, then you can see the influence of that tribe appearing again. So I wasn't surprised at all when I looked at how the civil war developed there. Now what happened there? Again, we have a different scenario. In this region, we have two important men. On the left, Ali Kebabte, a very important and powerful Kurdish chieftain of the Hevirkan tribe. Hevirkan is one of the biggest and most powerful uh, Kurdish tribes. And on the right, we have one of his best friends, the Assyrian man, Simon Hanna Heido, uh, who was an important Assyrian warrior. Now, because he was a personal friend of the Kurdish chieftain, they repelled the militias coming to kill the Armenians and the Assyrians in the genocide, purely because of the personal friendship. As a consequence, there was limited damage in the genocide to the Assyrian community. There was certainly damage. There were up to maybe 25, 30,000 people were killed. That's a huge massacre, but compared to the damage that could have been done to the at least 300,000 people, um, and relative to the Armenian genocide, we see that actually the, the death toll is relatively limited. But what happened is in this region, many Assyrians converted, many Armenians too in this region, they converted to Islam and they lived incognito under, uh, kind of undercover. And in the 1960s, there was a bishop, the Assyrian bishop, this man, Yohannum Tever. In the old picture on the right, he's the man holding the child by the head. I hope that's visible. Now, he's the bishop who, in the 1970s and 60s, traveled at great risk um, around the countryside to gauge how many people, how many Christians had survived the genocide in 1915. Right? Can you imagine this? So, in the 1960s, the Turkish government doesn't want to hear anything about the Armenian genocide. It's actually very dangerous to do any research or to ask around in the countryside, to poke around with skeletons in the closet. And here's this bishop who walks into these villages and maybe not blatantly, but certainly subtly, uh, inquires about, are there any Christians in this village or people who might have been Christians one generation ago? And what he manages to do is to, he manages to baptize um, dozens of people who knew that they were Armenian one generation ago, or Assyrian one generation ago. And he kind of um, has these people regain their identity. And so what we see then is that in the 1970s, the Armenians from the small town of Shubnak, like a, almost like a jack-in-the-box, reappear. Now we thought that these people were dead in the genocide. And in the 1970s, so they'd lived undercover for 50 years, more than 50 years, 
and almost like a jack-in-the-box, they appeared in this community and managed to migrate to Europe, where most of them live in, uh, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and in Germany. Um, Johann Antille, right now he's the bishop of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Berlin, on the Potsdamer Straße. You can go visit uh, and see him in action. And he's very old now. He must be in his early 90s, but he's still pretty, uh, pretty strong and a very friendly man. And we're doing an interview, a series of interviews with him now, because he's for the first time ever that he's speaking up about the heroic operation, really, that he, uh, that he did in the 1960s and 70s. So that's a third, a third example. How can we explain much of this? Now, I'd like to start first with ideology. Um, the Armenian Genocide was not necessarily in the interest of, of the Kurds. But the, many Kurds were kind of torn when the genocide hit their Armenian neighbors. Especially Kurdish intellectuals, they thought that the genocide was bad. They didn't think it was a good idea the Armenians were being killed. But it was also kind of useful because it eliminated any Armenian um, claim on the territory that they were sharing. Right? With, with no Armenians living in this region anymore, the Kurds could claim it for themselves. Then we see a lot of incentives being created. Second point, there, there were massive material and immaterial profits for the Kurds to be taken in the Armenian Genocide. And this probably was decisive in tipping them over into cooperation, collaboration in the Genocide. I'll give an example, a material very clear. I mean, if you were a poor Kurdish peasant living in the countryside, you have nothing. And one day the government walks up to you and says, uh, that rich Armenian peasant over there, if you kill him, you get to have his entire farm and all of his possessions. And we won't say anything about it. Now you can imagine a lot of, some of people must have thought, it's against my religion, it's against my ethics, and I don't really hate the guy, I kind of like him, or he's okay. But that the incentives were simply too high uh, not to be tempted. There are also immaterial profits. Um, in Kurdish society, you have to pay dowry. A man has to pay dowry to a woman if you want to get married. So if you can kidnap a woman and marry her, then it's cheaper, actually. You don't have to pay any dowry. So pure for that reason, even, a lot of people were, got involved. Now, religious hatred is often cited as, a, as one of the motives for the genocide. I think that's a very conflicting uh, scenario. On the one hand, there were Kurdish... Um, religious leaders who said the genocide is against our principles, it's against the Quran, it's against the Sharia law. So they argued, for example, in one famous case, that Armenians were Christians, and Christians were inferior to Muslims, but they shouldn't be killed. Right? They're just inferior. So this in bizarre form of racism kind of helped, um, helped them resist the genocide some, to some extent. And other lower clergy, very often they issued uh, decrees that it was fair and that was, that was good to kill Armenians. And if you kill seven Armenians, you, you could go to heaven. Kind of these kind of um, fatwas have also been issued. Now, um, the key, I think, is in the tribalism issue. Why? Because I think that it's tribal ties, uh, and I'll show you this little strange little graph, uh, tribal ties during the genocide, and maybe they still are, kind of stronger than ethnic ties, stronger than religious ties, and stronger than ideological identities, left versus right, etc. And if you imagine two tribes, just like on this graph, tribe A and tribe B, then what would happen is that the government, the Turkish government would um, demand one tribe, tribe A, to destroy Armenians. But because Armenians were often seen as property of a particular tribe, this tribe could only extend their massacres to another tribe's property, another tribe's Armenians. And so you wouldn't see that they would kill their own Armenians, so that's the green patch, the dark green patch, but they would kill a neighboring tribe's Armenians. And that tribe could, could then again take revenge and, and destroy their, uh, their neighbors. Uh, Armenian peasants very often. Uh, so when these tribes, when these Kurdish tribes, when they defended their own Armenians, they didn't necessarily do uh, 
do that because they felt that that killing was wrong or that genocide was was the wrong thing, but it was mostly because they were defending their own property. They were defending their peasants and uh, their own kind of tribal integrity. And of course, a lot of people would argue, well, tribalism is wrong and we should believe in equal citizenship, etc. It's all true, I agree. But in the genocide, it was the tribalism actually that uh, helped rescue many, uh, many Armenians. So, to bring this to a conclusion, how do Kurds feel about the Armenian genocide now? So if you would take, you, you would buy a plane ticket, you would fly to Turkey, walk into these Kurdish villages and towns, what would people say? Well, I've, I've done exactly that, taken a plane and flown to Turkey and walked around in these villages. And I've done quite a few interviews, or test, I've t taken testimonies of people who, whose parents had seen the genocide, has experienced the genocide. And I asked them, um, open questions, could you tell me about your family? And sooner or later, the Armenian issue came up. Sometimes in terms of taboos, don't ask about that. No, I don't want to answer your question. That kind of responses I've gotten. On the other hand, I've also had really frank confessions almost by people who knew their family was involved in the killings. So here's a woman I interviewed in Pertek, not very far from Chatsanjak. And it was a very interesting woman. She was in her 80s in 2004. And I asked her, um, hey, what do you remember about the Armenians? And she said, well, my father rescued an Armenian. And I said, well, that, that's great. What happened? Well, because my father was a, it was a, um, a shoemaker. And the Armenian man that he rescued was a colleague, was also a shoemaker. So because they, were, they shared his professional identity, my father took the man in, in the beginning of the genocide. It was, this was in April, May, 1915. But then gradually the Turkish government pressure mounted and mounted and mounted on the Kurds to deliver any Armenians that might have sheltered or, or hidden. So ultimately, one day the gendarmes, so this is the uh, um, police on the countryside, came into this woman's village and asked her father whether he was hiding any Armenians, or whether there were any Armenians in this village. And he said, no. And then the police said, well, if we found out, you must understand that we have to deport your whole family too. And then they left. And so the, her father, Fatma, that's her name, her father realized that there were probably enemies in the village or outside the village who, re who knew that he was hiding an Armenian. So ultimately, within the next couple of days, he actually took out the Armenian man and he shot him himself. So this is, of course, a very painful memory in the family. And he was a rescuer, of course, in the beginning, but later he became a perpetrator. So these categories, they also kind of slide one into the other. And um, I'd like to show you a brief, if I can, a brief section from a documentary, a short clip in which a man is being interviewed and he's quite frank, really, about what his family uh, had done. So let me see whether I can find this. So it's not this woman, but this woman, the man after this woman who starts talking. Ne yapalım? 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 Ne y
hem de birbirine kollarına bağlayarak yani, bağlayarak götürüyorlar bu masaya bir tür kişinin yanında kalktan biri bu tarafta burunlar ve bu tarafta biri bu tarafta bir de bir lavabo okumuş bir de okursun bir lavabo okur bir köyde şaban diye birisi bir de dede dede o zaman dedeniz o zaman asker miymiş? tabi asker miymiş? yani 1915'de mi? o var mı? o var Elazığ'da mı? Elazığ'da mı? burada değil Elazığ'da mı? dede mi anlatıyor mu? hemen anlatıyorsun numara bitecek ve tek anlatıyor Bak çok so, um, I know the subtitles were also in white, so was his shirt, but I mean, in, in a nutshell, um, what happens here is that the documentary maker, who has established contact with these people, asks one of the men, your father, we heard that your father killed a lot of Armenians, and a lot of Armenians. And the man, just, he knows the camera is there, so he just walks up and he just walks away. And then his son, who has also heard all these stories, of course, comes, which is this man, and he's heard all the stories because he was a boy when the stories were transmitted, and he, in full detail, as you can see, discloses that his father killed approximately 300 Armenians whose hands were tied together, and they were so two by two in a long convoy, and two men from each side, one was his grandfather, the other one was this other person, would stand by the side with axes, and then kind of hack into the necks of the Armenians. And then the next person would come and they would hack into the next person. And so they kind of exterminated the entire, entire convoy. And as you can see, he's quite, he's quite open about it. But if what we see here is a generation conflict. The son is deeply ashamed, clearly, what, what happened. He doesn't want to talk about it. The grandson, on the other hand, is a bit more open. And he's not necessarily ashamed. He feels almost as if it's a burden off his shoulders. He wants to get it off his chest. And so this kind of char characterizes many interviews that I've also done. And I think that it, this is why the work of the USC Shoah Foundation is so important in societies in which there, is a, there are taboos or the genocides are not discussed, and there are quite a few. Serbia, Guatemala, China, I could, I could name many societies. Um, th this kind of research and work, I think, is very important, and I think we should uh, definitely continue doing that kind of research. Thank you for your attention. If there are any uh, questions, of course, I'm happy to uh, answer, uh, answer them. Yeah. Were there any consequences for the perpetrators, she asks. Well, no, because if you watch the whole documentary, and I can circulate it, we learn in this documentary that the gentleman who was involved in the perpetration, his grandfather, he lived until the 1990s even. He was quite old, of course, by then, but there were no consequences. At no point in the 70s or 60s or 40s or 50s was he ever charged, arrested, or brought to justice. No, he, he managed to live a pretty happy life. He had a really big family, he has a nice farm, and there were never any consequences for the perpetrators except for total impunity. Yeah? So you mentioned that one of the incentives for the Kurdish people was um, geographical, the idea that you know, they could now have this land for themselves. Um, so then the Turks weren't planning to take that land? Was that not part of the region that they wanted to come to? Ah, um, I mean, in most of the, um, I mean, we can also, I can answer the question a bit broader. If you look at interviews with perpetrators, and I know, I mean, USC Shoah Foundation, um, Shoah Foundation does mostly interviews with uh, survivors. Uh, there's some with, with uh, bystanders or rescuers. Uh, if you look at interviews with perpetrators, I know. See, I've seen quite a few of them, and I've read quite a few accounts. Um, there is such an enormous variety of motives of why people get involved uh, in killings. And material benefits is um, universally one of them. Might not be the most prominent one, but universally getting something out of it um, is, is really one of the main kind of uh, 
motives. Whether this is materially in terms of money or land or property, or if it's just a career move, that can also happen. We have people who don't necessarily hate Jews, but if they can make a career in one particular unit, then they'll uh, enlist uh, in it. And land, I think, uh, is a very important motive in, in many, many genocides. Because there's only that much land on the planet, and we have to share it. And whether you look at Bosnia or um, genocide in Rwanda, where it's a very densely populated small country in Central Africa, or this region, land, especially arable land, uh, is, is a very prized uh, thing, of course. And those Kurds who cooperated in the genocide killed their, their Armenian neighbors, took their land. Very often they sat on that, ter on that uh, property for quite a while. But here's the interesting thing. I extended my research to the 1920s and 30s and 40s, so 30 years after the genocide. And what we see is that in the 1920s, the Turkish government makes a selection, a kind of rough um, categorization of Kurds. They're good Kurds, those who helped us in the genocide. They can keep their property. And then there are bad Kurds, those who either resisted or were aloof in the genocide. And if they cooperated or if they killed any Armenians and took their property, we will take their property away again. So in the 1930s, again, 20 years after the genocide, you see again an expropriation and a kind of transfer of property from the one group uh, to the other. Most people who uh, stole property in 1915, they still have most of that property. So it's quite easy to retrace it. Was it, yeah? Yeah, um, this is about, of course, the question is about the civil, the, uh, civil war in Syria and how tribalism or the behavior of Kurdish tribes uh, influences uh, the, the, the course of, this, of the civil war. I think in, in at least two ways. Uh, that tribe that I mentioned, the Hebir Khan tribe in the northeast of Syria, as you know, the border between Turkey, Syria, and Iraq was created in 19... 23, when um, the um, Turkish Republic was established, and then in the French and British mandates, the border between uh, Syria and Iraq was draw drawn by British imperialists straight through the desert uh, with no regard for where people live and where the families live, etc. Now, if we look at how the Syrian civil war developed in that region, in the northeast of Syria, A, we see a kind of um, distance to the goals of the Syrian revolution or the, the uprising, which was about uh, toppling Assad. The Kurds never really cared about toppling Assad too much. They cared more about autonomy. As long as there's a famous proverb in Kurdish, the snake that doesn't bite me can live for a thousand years. Does that make any sense? So Good, good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Um, so. And the notion here is, of course, that Assad may be terrible or the, and the rebels may, may be violent. As long as they don't come here into our tribal territory, then we're okay. So it's more like, it was more like a buffer zone. And it has developed into a buffer zone until, until now, really. Four years of civil war, very destructive. And the Kurdish regions are somewhat okay, except for Kobani, which is not in this region. And the second way in which this developed is that Kurds have looked, Kurds in Syria, this tribe, has look, have looked at Iraq at the Kurds in Iraq, and argued that autonomy or independence or kind of self-rule self has worked in Iraq, so it should also come to Syria. We, should, and we Kurds in Syria should also um, have a form of um, semi-independence or regional autonomy, regional government. And this is partly because the Kurds in Syria, of course, they have family in Iraq. So whatever happens in Iraq influences them directly in Syria as well, and the other way around. So in these two ways, 100 years before or after the genocide, these tribal dynamics are still very relevant. And they probably will be, because it never really succeeded. No, no government, whether it was Kemal Ataturk in the 1920s and 30s, or Saddam Hussein in the 80s and 70s, has, no government has really been successful in dismantling Kurdish tribes. It's been extremely difficult to do that. There was a thing over here. Yeah. yeah uh, in your opinion, um, was the 
biggest incentive for the Army and FBI to involve the security strategy is more of an accountability to kind of shift the onus and blame off their shoulders a little bit. So I know now they're like, tra like tracking back and saying, oh, we didn't really say much, or was it more of a logistical thing, numbers, easier for them? What do you think? What do you think? I mean, this is one of the uh, early Turkish denialist arguments. Yeah. If you would talk to a Turkish diplomat in the 1970s or 80s, and you would ask him about why did so many Armenians die in the, in the First World War, he would have said, it's always he, so I'm not being sexist, uh, he would have said inadvertently, because, well, the Kurds were living there, right? I mean, what are you gonna, um, what do you expect uh, from the Kurds other than massacre and oppression of, of Christians and Armenians? So that's definitely, in hindsight, of course, to shift the blame. Uh, there are other issues. Uh, one of the other problems could have been that um, the Kurdish tribes who cooperated in the genocide were later also better integrated in the Turkish Republic. So there are still tribes who are actually quite close to the government. In some case, um, those tribes who are now very close to the government region locally were those who had also been active in the genocide. But only kind of a micro study, micro historical study, can, can, um, can elucidate that. Otherwise, it, it's more difficult to kind of, as I said, to do these, you know, these blanket observations. They're, they're really not appropriate. Yeah? Go ahead, you, you first. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that the tribes viewed the Armenians as like property and wouldn't kill their Armenians. Yeah, kill other exactly. There is a there is a prehistory indeed of uh, of serfdom locally in some regions, but I think Richard can answer that question much better. Richard, what do you think? Maybe I also forgot to mention, I said that there were religious differences in Kurdish society, there were um, ethnic differences, there were um, east-west problems, much as, uh, much as, army, uh, much as with the Armenians. And also there's class problems as well. Some Kurds were uh, tribal. Most Kurds are actually, one way or the other, at some point, come from a tribe. But they're also non-tribal Kurds. And very often these people were kind of landed peasants. And they were treated in the same way as Armenians were treated. Serfdom, very few build relations, and entirely disempowered and disenfranchised. So, you know, you see that it's not simply an ethnic overlap in the serfdom. Yeah, in the case that you gave of the Armenian not looking in, yeah. um, Yeah. Uh, the lady who, whose picture I showed, whose father killed, first hid and then killed this Armenian guy. What could he have done differently? I mean, ha, huh, this is a very difficult, uh, very difficult dilemma. I mean, this morning we watched a, um, an, an eyewitness account with Crispin of um, a Jewish man in Ukraine. And it's a very interesting dynamic. This man was, he, he walked up to this farm and he addressed somebody in this farm who said, well, if you hide me upstairs, you give me food, I won't say anything. If you don't give me food, I'll walk to the Germans and I'll tell the Germans that you helped me. So I'll go down if you're going down with me. So it's a very interesting dynamic in which the victim actually holds hostage or um, blackmails the rest of the quote unquote. So here I think we're dealing with a similar, with a similar issue. I mean, this Kurdish man, could have, he could have released this Armenian man but then you have a witness who might be even um, under duress. Let's say that the Turkish police arrested him, tortured him, 
and, and then finally got out the name of his rescuer. Then they would kill the Armenian and also the Kurd. So rather than having two deaths, I think he, he gave in to the fear, I think you're right. Um, and rather than having two, death, two deaths, he opted uh, for one. So these are some of the absolutely terrible decisions that people make in genocides. And also, and also he was thinking about his own family. Possibly, you know? So you can risk your own life rescuing, um, rescuing someone, but and I'll, I can ask all of you, which is a totally hypothetical situation, would you risk the life of your loved ones to rescue a random stranger? So I see a lot of people nodding, no, I won't. So this, I think this awkward silence here kind of sums it up, how the, the, the decisions that people had to make back then. And those who had, actually, those who did risk the lives of their families, too. There were some serious heroes out there, but that's a small minority. Yeah, very, very interesting. This is what we'll talk about uh, in the next couple of conferences as well. Did the, Turks, did the Turkish government only want the land of the Armenians? So did they just want to take the Armenians, move them somewhere else, kill a whole bunch in the process, move them somewhere else, and they can live in, I don't know, in Russia or in, in, in the desert or on the moon as far as they're concerned? Did they just want the land or did they hate the Armenians as a community so fundamentally that they wanted to wipe them out? Um, I think that there's evidence for, the, for both in the Turkish state, but this is not a cop-out. I'll take a position here. I think the elite, the very elite of the government, Turkish government, wanted primarily the land. But there were people in the mid-level, bureaucrats and governors, such as that radical guy that I mentioned, uh, and others lower down in the hierarchy, in the chain of command, who hated Armenians with a passion and wanted them exterminated no matter where they lived. Because what is the evidence for this? Well, at some point when a completely emaciated and disempowered Armenian remnant community in the Syrian desert, right, when they pushed in, they're killed and deported, at some point the Turks discontinued the genocide. Like late 1917 or mid 1917, there's even a, a telegram by the head of the, um, of the interior ministry, the man who ran the, who ran the genocide, in which he says, okay, I think I think this is enough. I think we've taught them a lesson. I don't think they're coming back anytime soon. So what they also could have decided is, okay, there's still some survivors there. We need to eradicate every single crumb from the face of the planet. That wasn't the case. They didn't want the Armenians to live in Armenia, in the territory, because that could have been a claim for independence and a claim for um, um, separatism, which was the biggest. Uh, the biggest problem, the biggest fear of the Turkish government. Yeah? Um, I have a question regarding your work on genocides in general. I yeah. just want to ask you your opinion on what gets called a genocide and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the processes that you described were very vivid and very clear. And those are things that happen all the time and have happened in history and are happening right now. They are. So what, that, that's my question. Yeah, okay. Um, what, who, so who decides what, what is called the genocide uh, and, and what not? Um, I live in Amsterdam, and we tend to think we're the center of the world in Amsterdam, of course, uh, but we're not. Uh, in The Hague, there are at least two or three important tribunals. There's the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the ICTY, there's the International Criminal Court, and there's the International Court of Justice. Now, I have a lot of friends who, who work there as lawyers. Uh, for defense counsel, for example, but also in the prosecution of Serbian war criminals. Um, of, for example, recently there was this guy from the Lord's Resistance Army from Uganda. His name was Dominic Ongwen. This is a boy who, when he was 14, he was walking to school, and the Lord's Resistance Army, which is an extremist Christian group in Uganda, kidnapped him, uh, brainwashed him, forced him to kill his own family, and then recruit other child soldiers who have done absolutely terrible things to people. Now, my friends and colleagues who are lawyers at the tribunals, they would argue that only us lawyers can define what genocide is. Because the genocide 
convention was a legal document, wasn't it? That's true. Raphael Lemkin, too, was a lawyer. But when I read Lemkin, and when I read the, the convention, the UN Genocide Convention, I see quite a few mistakes as a historian and as a sociologist. And I'll give you an example. Political groups were not included in the Genocide Convention. So if you're, if you're a government and you kill a political category, let's say you kill all liberals or all communists, for example, or alleged communists, then that, according to the legal definition, is not called genocide. Even though in 1965-66, the Indonesian government killed approximately 500,000, probably slightly more, alleged communists and, and real communists from the PKI, the Communist Party of Indonesia. And the, so the, that genocide functioned to the logic. Anybody who's a communist right now will be arrested, will be executed. You cannot change your identity anymore. So you can't say, OK, sorry, I was wrong about communism. I'll step out of this ideology. And then I don't have to be killed anymore. No, that's not how it works. Once a communist, always a communist. They were taken, shot, executed over pits, or thrown into rivers. Um, and that continued for about a year in Indonesia. Now, according to the Genocide Convention, that's not a genocide, because it's not ethnic, racial, or religious group. I tend to disagree. I think that any murderous policy that assaults any group identity is a form of genocide because genocide assaults the abstract notion of group identity and not individualism. It doesn't care about individualism. It's nothing personal. It's only about the group. And I think throughout history, there have been many groups that are not national, ethnic, or religious that have been assaulted. For example, gays have been assaulted by various regimes. Um, the Nazis, for example, of course, persecuted and killed many gays. Um, ISIS right now is running an interesting campaign in which they're killing systematically anybody even suspected of gay, uh, what do they call it, gay behavior? Uh, who knows what that is? Uh, so that to me entirely is genocidal. So the lawyers have their def definition, the academic researchers have their definition, but then also some political groups also have their definition. Some people argue that Ebola was a form of genocide or that the outbreak of AIDS was a form of genocide. Uh, that's a little bit spurious, I think. Any other? Yeah. Um, Boston College recently did a project in Ireland where they recorded uh, testimonies of perpetrators um, involved with IRA and some of the conflict. Yeah. And what ended up happening, I was really fascinated, the 60 Minutes just did a feature on this, the public started shaming those Very, very good question. Um, to what extent are people who speak openly, such as this man, because he knows this is going to be broadcast over television, everybody will see it. To what extent is there shaming or pressure on these kind of people? I think quite a bit. Uh, there will be quite a bit, let me, let me put it that way. There hasn't been so much yet, because these kind of testimonies haven't been out in the public so much. Right? I mean, this, this is literally like the first, or maybe the second or third documentary in Turkey so far, <coughs> which has dealt with um, testimonies of the Armenian genocide. Once this spreads, and once the you know, population gets a sense of, uh, of what's going on, then pressures might be, might be higher. But they will be really different locally. Like in one region, people will be much more open. In others, they will be much more against speaking out. Here's an interesting problem. I mean, this man, I'm sure that once, the moment they turned off the camera, his, his, his father started fighting with him. I'm absolutely sure about that. Probably his father said, what are you doing telling these complete strangers about our family history? Right? And of course, all of you in this room have parents and have grandparents. And all of your families, too, have skeletons in the closet. That's only normal. All families do. So, so does mine. Quite a few, actually. Uh, so that's only normal. But would you want the general public to um, be exposed to your dirty laundry? Maybe even all of us 
really nice people here wouldn't want that. And so I do expect some conflicts to arise. Maybe not necessarily because of the Armenian genocide nature of the, of the problem, but because there's intimate family details that are being disclosed. And even outside of a genocide context, people don't really like that. So, and also depends on how the government will deal with it. The Turkish government will say, this man's a liar, then he'll think twice next time before he speaks. Because then you're, you live under the threat of government oppression, of government pressure. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the land question. Um, yeah. Can you um, specify a little bit more um, when you talk about the Turkish government at the time, and you said um, the question is now, and you made this, uh, did they want land or not? Um, is this land uh, perceived in uh, this case as taking control over territory, or is land more um, kind of understood as a resource? Because these are two very different things. And the resource would go more, much more in the direction of the former claim that the Turkish government needed land for the uh, uh, free migrants from the Balkans, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. uh, which then contradicts a little bit the micro history. Historical account you gave that uh, the Kurds, the Kurdish tribe actually acquired the land, um, which should have been should have been given to the migrants. Right? So can yeah. you elaborate a little bit more on this contradiction? Uh, yeah, um, very good question. Well, uh, this, he's he's asking a question about whether uh, maybe we should backtrack a little bit. The First World War begins 1914, but in 1912-13 there were the Balkan Wars in which the Ottoman Empire lost most of their possessions in the Balkans. So there was the war before the war, really. And in the Balkan Wars, after the Balkan Wars, after Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece became what they are now, roughly, uh, many Muslims, or Turks, quote unquote, were expelled from those societies and ended up in Istanbul. Completely destitute, refugees, they have nothing. They're vindictive, they have been beaten, uh, killed, massacred, raped. And, and they ended up in Istanbul with very serious traumas. Now, the government had to settle these people somewhere, but there was not enough land or arable lands. And in the eastern provinces, in the Armenian provinces, much of the good lands that were in, in the hands of the Armenians uh, were, of course, prized possession. So after the genocide, or during the genocide even, these refugees that were, who were victimized themselves were not only partly used in the genocide, but also they were settled. So when the Armenians were moved out, the empty houses, the empty land were resettled, uh, resettled with, these, uh, with these refugees. But here's the trick. Many of these refugees didn't want to go to the Kurdish regions. So, because they thought, well, maybe we'll go back to the Balkans one day. Why would I travel all the way to the other side of the country where there's a hostile climate? Uh, it's a bit more like a desert. These people came from very lush, mountainous regions in the Balkans. I don't want to settle there. Not to mention, amidst the hostility of Kurdish tribes armed to the teeth, not a very hospitable um, area to settle in. So um, to some extent, I think this, you know, we, we can argue, yes, these refugees were important in settling in the empty land taken from the Armenians. This is also the intention of the Turkish government, because you have to put the refugees somewhere. Where, well, OK, well. Uh, might as well combine the useful with the, with the pleasant, as they say. And uh, so the, as Armenians were being expelled, their empty spaces were filled up with these refugees. In some cases, as I said before, bad Kurds, those who did not help in the genocide, they were also taken away uh, or deported later, and their empty spaces were also filled with refugees. But a lot of these refugees didn't like the area. It was inhospitable. They would get typhoid and tuberculosis, and the, the heat was also quite unbearable to them. They were from the mountains and not from the desert. Good, very good question. But that opens the problem of the Balkan Wars, right? Mm -hmm. Completely different nightmare. Yeah? Any other questions? Okay, then. Um, oh, there was a small one, maybe. Yeah. This is a generic question, actually. Sure. But, uh, how long do you think it will take until there's international recognition for all these genocides? For all these genocides? Uh, for, for this genocide. <laughs> Uh, how long will it take? Well, there's, there's a lot of international recognition already. Um, how long it will take? I don't, I don't think you can, you can say. Like, I mean, do all countries in the world have to recognize the Armenian genocide? And even uh, a country like Cameroon or Zimbabwe, 
who have really nothing to do with the entire region, have no history with these people. I think the most important thing is that Turkey recognizes the genocide and that it comes to terms with its own history. I think that's much more important. And how long that will take? Well, it's been 100 years now. No real progress in sight. Not really. At the state level, not really. So if I live long enough, in the next, <coughs> in the next 100 years, in the year 2115, I'll come here and I'll give another talk <laughs> about 200 years of denial. But I try not to, um, to end on a depressing note. I think there's been quite a, quite a lot of progress going on in the past 10 years. And uh, so in two weeks, I'm in Istanbul for a conference on the Armenian genocide. Um, that conference has been under pressure in various ways, but um, that was unthinkable 20 years ago. Absolutely unthinkable, off the radar. So there's quite a lot of progress. One more question there. By Wilson, you mean President Wilson's 14 points? Uh, the, yeah, th those were after. They were, those were issued after the war, not during the genocide. But but what what is true, I think, is that the reform plan of Army in 1914 um, was unmistakably a step in which the great powers came together and said, "Well, we need some form of autonomy for Armenia state." That was gradually a step towards uh, independence. I don't think that that's deniable, not considering the previous policies of the great powers. Um, but it's a very good question. But how, how do external factors, because I talk mostly about the relationship between the Turkish state and the Armenian minority. What about the rest of the world? Well, it made a profound impact also that there were external patrons for, for, for Armenians in various ways. Whether these really helped out or not is really not important. But when an external force, a great power too, such as France or Russia, would tell the Turks, you have to deal with your Armenians better, and we're going to help them, the Turkish government felt really undermined. So they thought Armenians were working together with an external enemy. Right? And so in the minds of the elites, this construction was, was pretty prominent. And because of um, some of the um, observations, some of the notices of the Russian Tsar, for example, I think Part of the sphere was unfounded, uh, but considering the great power involvement in the Balkans, right? So the great powers basically supported Serbia, Bulgaria, and Greece. I mean, Greece is a country that is established by Britain, roughly speaking. Uh, then that paranoia is maybe not even entirely unfounded. So I understand. I, I understand why. Um, why somebody like Talat Pasha, sort of architect of the genocide, uh, brought these two things together. We have internal enemies, and we have external enemies, and they're working together. The, the way to defeat the external enemy is to destroy their internal clients. So that's a, that's a, that's a good observation, I think. Yeah? OK. OK, so um, uh, please give a hand uh, to Thank you. appreciate that uh, he could actually uh, very elo eloquently uh, kind of uh, explain these very complex circumstances here. So thank you very much uh, for this wonderful Thanks. presentation. Thank you. Okay. Let's try and do that. I'll turn this off.